Hi, I'm CJ and this is my RC channel. In this video, I'm going to begin modifying the 124019 buggy. And if you recall from the previous video, or if you haven't watched it, just a little update uh, or a little refresher. Um, I had a problem with the drive shaft uh, when I was doing uh, some gear swapping. The, um, the screw that holds the gear onto the drive shaft sheared when I tried to loosen it because there was so much Loctite in there so I needed to order a new drive shaft. Um, took a little while to come in, finally found one on Amazon. It's about $15 I think and it includes as you can see the gears, uh, bearings, uh, the gears at either end. Uh, they're giving you a lot for the 15 bucks. Uh, here are the uh, remaining gears that I also have that was from that upgraded gear pack that I've already done in the diffs. Um, the diffs are holding up just fine. When I open them, we'll see if there's been any leakage of that uh, uh, silicone diff fluid. I filled them about a millimeter and a half or so from the top. Uh, you can also go back and review that video if you haven't seen the diff build. Um, I may show parts of the diff build uh, in this because I'm going to be rebuilding those diffs with these aluminum cases. And uh, if you if you watched the previous video, again, sorry to keep repeating that, you would see that those stock cases are of a very soft plastic. I could literally squeeze them between two fingers and, and totally uh, take them out of round. Um, so uh, that's where we're going right now. Now there's still an issue uh, with this screw here being completely stripped again way too much loctite i was able to get this one out uh, but this one stripped on me i've got an easy out uh, that i picked up a little set of these things and i'll show you how to use those i'm going to be heating this up with a soldering iron um, one of my viewers uh, left a very nice comment explaining that what he or other people he had seen do is to uh, either use like a little blowtorch or a soldering iron to uh, transfer heat you know, either through the metal item itself or through the screw, uh, thus uh, loosening up and or burning away the thread locker. So I'm going to try doing that um, and see how that goes. I suspect it'll probably work great. It sounded like very good advice. Uh, I wish I had thought of it before I stripped this. Um, now, some people have also mentioned in other videos that sometimes it's better just to change the uh, motor mount uh, because they're only about $4 or so and they tend to get destroyed, like getting the screws off of the motor supposedly is difficult or problematic at least. Uh, the heat transfer issue uh, might help that though, um, you know, as I was saying, you know, burning away the, uh, the Loctite. Um, so we'll see if I need to make that switch or not, but I did go ahead and order one. I didn't want to get caught uh, without one and uh, be stuck. So I may be putting that on. Um, we're going to go to a standalone brushed uh, ESC and receiver. So this ESC is going to mount over here, uh, or maybe over here, depending. I'll have to see how space goes. Um, but this is going to go... And the motor is going to go, and I'm replacing that motor with this. It's a 12-turn uh, 550 motor, and it should be hotter than this uh, performance-wise. It's, it's the same length, so the same amount of space either with either one. Um, and then, of course, I'll need a standalone receiver, which is right here. Um, this is a uh, FlySky product. Um, they make a very nice six channel surface radio that I picked up and uh, so far I'm thrilled with it. I bought a bunch of these receivers because they are so inexpensive. I'm gonna uh, change the majority of my cars over to that radio if it um, continues to perform as well as it is. Uh, I'm gonna use that on into the future indefinitely for any of my surface vehicles. Uh, because it's so inexpensive and they make two versions of these the standard version I, th I think was around $18 they make a version that has a gyro in it now I've never used a gyro in a car um, but some people like them for um, cars that do a lot of sliding um, like uh, people who do drifting and stuff um, 
you know, on a certain level, being a bit of a purist when it comes to, you know, cars and being a lifelong gearhead, uh, I've always kind of uh, not looked down on, but didn't want to lower myself to using an assistance uh, piece of software or something like that um, in in my flying or my driving. Uh, and you certainly can't use them for racing. So if you're going to compete, you don't want to get reliant on one in the first place because you can't use it in competition in either flying or driving. So, um, but I've seen how they do for airplanes and it's really nice having that safety net where even if you're not using it, you can set it up so that you've got a like a get out of jail free button if you lose control of the plane or even if you just lose sight of it, you can flip a button and it goes into its, um, its safe mode and it auto corrects for whatever attitude the plane is in and achieves level flight. And then you can kind of figure out you know, okay, where's the plane or, you know, what should I do now? You know, kind of get your, you know, get your bearings again. Um, and, uh, you know, if you were doing some aerobatics and lost control of the plane, having that get out of jail free card before you hit the ground can save a lot of money, uh, not to mention gray hair. So, um, anyway, uh, you know, as far as the gyro goes, that's your choice, but it's around $25. So if you wanted to experiment, it's not a, a large expense uh, comparatively to what most receivers cost and uh, what receivers with gyros cost. So again, uh, that's where I'm going now, just straight up regular receiver. Um, you know, again, it'll either mount here or here, depending on, you know, where this ends up. Uh, battery's not going to change. I've, I've heard, you know, some people trying 3S's and burning up their ESC's and stuff. If you've got the correct ESC, um, there's no reason you couldn't run uh, larger packs, but um, I, I race um, uh, 10 scale all wheel drive uh, cars and trucks, and they are crazy fast when you've got the right motor and the right gearing with a 2S pack. They, they are very, very fast. So unless you are strictly shooting for a, a speed test, um, you know, you don't necessarily need to, uh, to worry about battery pack. Um, just a little food for thought, uh, for those of you, especially who are new to the hobby, as you saw in the last video with the updated speed test, uh, this is not a trim knob for the throttle. It basically gives you a top speed limiter. And considering how fast this car is, unless you're driving in a parking lot or a large area, um, having this thing be able to do 34 miles an hour is unnecessary or almost a little overboard. Um, top speed doesn't do you any good if you can't use it. If you can't uh, slow down enough, take a corner and come back um, or, you know, make multiple turns without any degree of accuracy in a way that you can repeat, um, all you're doing is bashing. And if that's what you want to do, that's great. Knock yourselves out. Um, I'm not a basher. I don't look down on it. I certainly had my days uh, when I was younger where, you know, all I wanted to do was see how fast things could go or how high I could jump them. But as I got into uh, competition and my mindset changed to repetitive, accurate performances versus, you know, one crazy flash in the pan maneuver. Um, the ability to do consistent laps, to take the same turn at the same speed again and again and again, um, turn after turn after turn, lap after lap after lap, and slowly increase that performance, increase that speed, uh, tuning the car, learning how suspension works, learning how to um, make the car go faster, really explore its, its mechanical limits um, other than just straight line velocity. 
uh, that that kind of became my focus and that's still where I'm at and I do tend to think from that mentality so you know anything I say bear that in mind that that's that's where my head's at that's where I'm uh, trying to go with my vehicles so if you are just bashing that's great have fun knock yourselves out um, most people in my opinion do not need to do any of the changes that I'm doing in this video well the aluminum diff cases great swap them out I'm all in favor of that they're far more durable uh, they're gonna fit better they're gonna last longer um, I definitely advise doing that I certainly advise doing what I did in the first videos which was doing a rebuild and putting proper silicone diff fluid not oil not shock fluid silicone differential fluid you need that in the diffs if you're going to have good differential performance and make this vehicle last you're going to be much happier if you've seen my speed runs where I was doing my speed testing on this to get a top speed baseline you can hear that the car runs very quietly it's very smooth there's no gear you know nastiness nothing's grinding or, or cogging or chopping uh, and it's going to continue to run like that if I did nothing else to it this would run just fine for a long long time because of doing that rebuild and putting that fluid in there um, so you know 34 miles an hour is plenty fast and for the size of this vehicle that is a ridiculously high scale speed so if you've got like a little dirt track near your house or you've you know set up a few ramps in your backyard or whatever where you can you know zoom this car around maybe you've got a couple friends who have the same car doing a bunch of mods to it like a huge engine bigger battery pack all this other stuff is not going to make for faster lap times necessarily um you could you really should spend your time learning to tune the car tune suspension and learning to drive well um you know unless you can do you know do consistent laps where you're not crashing uh not losing control of the rear end or pushing the front end off um you're you're not even starting to improve um, that's the first step is to get to where you can do consistent laps at whatever speed even if it's you think it's slow if you're getting around consistently you're on the right road and from there you start adjusting the suspension you start learning what makes the car handle different what makes for improvements what what is detrimental and and you make the car your own and slowly over time you build consistency and speed um, any of you have ever, you know, done anything in, in as far as real motorsports go, if you've ever been through uh, a driver's school, you know that smooth is fast. Um, the people who look like they're going slow are usually the ones turning the fastest laps. The guys who are hanging the rear end out and they're all over the place and the they're getting smoke off the tires and they're locking up brakes, those guys are not turning the fast laps. The guys who are smooth and consistent, those are the guys that are going fast. So anyway, enough on that. Uh, let's move forward. So, but this is something you can use to help moderate yourself. I've had some people ask, um, you know, is this too much of a motor? You know, some motor that they've picked out and they're thinking about putting in the car. Um, nothing is too fast. It's a matter of, can you control it? at that speed um, and dialing this down a little bit and learning to drive the car well would serve you much better than throwing in what you hope is going to be a faster motor turning this all the way up to 11 and seeing you know just how fast it'll go in a straight line that doesn't mean you're going to get around a track fast at that speed so I am going to start by taking some stuff apart. You don't need to watch the disassembly again. Um, if you're curious about how this car goes together and comes apart, um, watch the previous video or videos on where I disassemble it and do the initial diff rebuild. 
uh, you'll see everything bolt for bolt. Um, you'll see all the changes that I did, like uh, putting in the droop screws and things like that. Everything that gets the car to where it is now, which is a nice, smooth running, good handling, reliable car. Okay, uh, good rule of thumb when you're working with a car. Usually the first thing to take off is the wheels and tires. Just get them out of your hair. Usually makes working on the car easier. Um, now, there is another thing that needs to be replaced. And... If you plan on uh, going with a non-stock uh, speed controller receiver, you need a new servo because this servo has five leads, not three, which is standard. Standard servo has a positive uh, ground and the third wire is the signal wire and that's what tells the servo how far and which direction to move. Um, so I've got a, uh, a little micro server here. It's a Tower Pro MG90S micro server servo. It's a Metal Gear servo. Very inexpensive. Um, I picked these up in a, like an eight pack or something like that. They're probably like three or four dollars a piece at that price. Um, I think it'll fit. I should be able to make it fit one way or another. I might need to make my own mount. Uh, we'll see. So I'm going to start by taking these mounts off. Uh, these are into plastic, so they shouldn't have any thread locker on them. They weren't even very tight. I might need to uh, either make my own or drill some new holes. Uh, we'll see. how close these are in size not far off not far off at all I might be able to put a like a spacer or a shim or something and uh, use the existing mount maybe not he thinks not I don't know this plastic is reasonably soft might be able to get that to squeeze in. No, that's not going to work. I'm going to need to do something of my own. Maybe I'll uh, 3D print something and put the file online. Uh, I'll think about it for a few minutes. I might look around. I might have some uh, parts uh, or some uh, stock that I can use to uh, create a couple of mounts. We'll see but uh, this is the servo I am going to use for sure. So one way or another, I'm going to figure out how to mount that. So uh, in the meantime, I'm going to continue the disassembly. Just wanted to let you know that that is an issue you need to contend with uh, because if you start buying parts, you know, you get your new speed control, you get your receiver, you start taking the car apart, and then you come across that. <laughs> and you're stuck. So... Got another build tip for you. Um, when you are working with this car and you take off the center section here, that holds down your steering linkages and the crossbar here. So one thing you can do is take the screws that were in place and just screw those down like I've done on this one. And it's just an aluminum barrel. There's just, you don't need to overly tighten it. That's going to keep these linkages from coming off, falling off on you when you're working on it. And then you've got to, you know, you might have bearings get loose on you and things like that. So uh, just putting those two screws back in keeps everything in place. So, you know, you can turn the car over and do what you need to do without having your steering linkage just fall off. Um, and uh, keep an eye on your on your wheel locks because you don't want the pins getting away on you so if you you know if you pull on these or if they come loose the little linkage pin is gonna drop off on you having a magnet around is a really good thing um, a while back and I'm talking like a handful of years at least 
I bought uh, a bunch of these from Bell and Howell uh, to give away as gifts to some of my friends. One of my buddies is a, a professional mechanic. Um, bought one for my father and they extend outwards and have a flexible end and there's a big magnet here around the LED lights. So that makes it really easy to help you find parts. There's also a magnet at this end, but if you drop a steel part on the floor, they can get lost in the carpeting pretty easy. This is a great way to help find them. So um, I don't know if these are still made in this particular layout here, but not a bad idea to find something like this, even just a handheld magnet. Um, you can use to go over your carpeting with and, uh, you know, find things that have fallen into the weave of the, of the carpet, especially small pieces like those little pins. It's a great way to get them. So we have this issue with this uh, servo that doesn't have a standard three pin connector. Um, so what I did was I made this bracket. I just uh, 3D printed this, uh, designed it up in CAD. And this is a mini servo. Uh, these are available on Amazon, among other places. It's an all metal gear servo. They're pretty torquey for being uh, uh, a mini servo. And uh, a standard size servo wouldn't fit in here anyway. Uh, so this little bracket just slides over the servo like so and uh, bolts down in the uh, original holes. Now, I made these holes at one millimeter. Um, depending on your printer, it may squeeze them in a little bit. Um, I wanted to make sure there was enough material to uh, grab threads if you use the standard screws. Um, you might even need to drill these out a little more, make a little more of a pilot hole so you don't split the plastic. That probably won't happen, but um, it doesn't hurt. And uh, I'm gonna be using some uh, Allen head uh, regular type of screws. Um, I just need to uh, uh, widen these holes out a little bit and then I'll pre-tap them uh, where I can have this held in my hand before you know, using an electric drill and one of the screws before I go ahead and bolt it on. Uh, that just makes it easier to, to work with. Um, so I'll make these uh, the CAD plans for these available and I'll make the Cura file available as well for those of you who don't want to deal with having to figure out the slicing yourself. I used a very uh, thick uh, wall width. Um, usually the wall thickness on 3D prints is measured in uh, tenths of a millimeter. I went with a three millimeter thickness and then a 50% fill because I didn't want uh, a lot of vacuous space um, in, in the print. I wanted this to be almost solid plastic uh, because that way it's as strong as can be. Um, it has a little flex in it, but once it's bolted down, there's not going to be any flex at all. Uh, the top has a little bit of um, hexing on the inside. Um, but again, it all depends on how you slice it. If you uh, go ahead and re-slice the file, the original file itself, the STL file. Um, so, uh, and if if you guys are without printers, um, maybe we can work something out. If a, a bunch of you need these, I can probably run some off and uh, uh, we can work out a way that you can uh, pay me for, you know, the plastic and the shipping probably, you know, um, I would say under $10 total, depending on where you are in the world. Um, but, you know, if you've got a hobby shop nearby that has a 3D printer, they can uh, run the files off for you. You know, great. I'll, I'll put the files on one of the uh, uh, file sharing services. So. so basically, I'm just using a two millimeter bit. I may end up upping that to a 2.5. I'm going to start with this and see how it goes. go to 2.5 I think all 
Also, uh, WL Toys builds a lot of their kits or cars on the same basic chassis. Um, in a, for example, this is identical to the the 144001, I think it is. Um, the only difference is the length of the aluminum pan, the length of the side rails, the length of the drive shaft. Um, it's just a, a longer wheelbase. But other than that, the shocks, the um, diffs, the diff cases, uh, the drive gear, the, um, the motor mount, everything is identical. And that even goes for, uh, they've got some like mini monster trucks that are again, the same drive line. So they are probably all using the same receiver, the same servo. Um, this servo mount would probably work to mod any of those to a standard servo. So now I'm just gonna pre-tap or pre-thread these uh, these holes. Okay, so now threads are cut. That makes it a lot easier to bolt this in. Oh, and um, these uh, these holes, I'm going to have to widen out that hole there just a little bit. Yeah, three millimeters will do. There we go. There we go. One solidly mounted servo. And the servo has zero movement inside that bracket. So, uh, success. to adjust this turnbuckle a little bit. But that's probably better sorted when I've got this on the tuning block again. Probably just needs to be shortened a couple millimeters. So uh, now it's time to get this motor off of here but before I can do that, I need to get the drive shaft free, which means I need to take the top of the diffs off. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and move on with that. Let's see. Yeah, um, again, you've seen this disassembly before, so um, I'm not going to go ahead and film the whole uh, taking everything apart. Um, if you're curious and want to see how all this goes together and comes apart, uh, watch the original uh, couple of videos where I do that. These are some little tools for removing stripped screws. And the, uh, the threads are 
counter directional to the direction of a normal screw. So you kind of like drill a little bit of a hole in the top and then you put one of these threaded ends in and let it bite and basically um, unscrew the, uh, the damaged screw. If you think that servicing your diffs is too much work, um, I've had race cars, good race cars built by reputable manufacturers that you can't get into the diffs this easy. Um, basically, I just took off the top bolts on the shock towers, folded the shocks off to the side. Um, I took off the two screws that hold the uh, crossbar for the steering which blocks access to these two screws here, six screws on either housing, and then all you gotta do is lift the div housing up. You don't need to take the shock tower off. You don't need to take anything else off on outboard. Um, the, uh, the drive shaft just lifts straight out, and then you, um, you just lift out the diffs and uh, pull them off the dog bones, and here you are. Um, now, so far, I haven't noticed any uh, diff fluid leaking, even though there aren't any uh, gaskets on these. So I may or may not need to go with some paper gaskets at some point on the, uh, the aluminums. I'm going to try building them up without, um, mainly because I don't have any, plat uh, any um, gasket paper handy. And I would need to get something very thin uh, to work with these anyway. So... Um, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, there's always the option of using like liquid gasket uh, and you would only need a very thinnest of film of that anyway. So um, I'm going to just uh, build them up straight up and uh, tighten them down solidly um, and uh, see how they, you know, how they hold the fluid over time and just check them periodically and, you know, we'll see. But uh, yeah, I don't think that's going to be a big issue. So... Um, I'm going to be taking, I'm going to be working on that motor mount screw in a few minutes. Uh, but I thought first I'd go ahead and uh, build up the diffs um, with these uh, aluminum housings. So I'll show you the parts of that that are relevant. Uh, but you guys have already seen the diff builds before in the previous videos. So um, I'll probably just show you one. And, uh, you know, it's the same process for front and rear. The only difference is the, the weight of the fluid. And uh, just for your reference, I'm using some 5,000 weight in the rear and a slightly thicker 7,000 up front. Uh, that seemed to do just fine. And, um, you know, I wasn't uh, turning timed laps or anything with this. So, uh, you know, really hard to say. But, um, you know, again, it, it, the car felt fine. It drove really well. Um, it cornered nicely. And, uh, you know, there was good response. I didn't have any uh, any issues. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and run this same uh, 5,000 rear, 7,000 front and uh, see where it takes me. I always recommend doing diffs on top of a towel, um, especially ball diffs. It just keeps small items from rolling away on you. Um, it also helps keep fluid off of your work mat and whatnot. Um, so uh, when I opened this up, it still had diff fluid in it. It definitely lost some. And I gave these a bit of an examination. It's not coming out of the, uh, where the, the housing meets up with the gear. Uh, it comes out down here uh, where these uh, little drives go in because they don't have any O-rings or anything in there to, uh, to seal them. Uh, most diffs have an O-ring uh, right inside uh, there's like a little beveled edge and there'll be an o-ring in there a little rubber gasket which helps prevent uh, fluid from escaping so what i'm going to do um, to help mitigate that uh, is go with a heavier diff fluid and then of course i'll um, probably have to check them a little more often and uh, uh, replace you know fluid uh, that gets lost over time there's no way to gasket uh, these up so um you know, it just is what it is. It's a limitation of the model, uh, but um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, and just go with thicker fluid and hopefully reduce loss that way. Um, that will stiffen the diffs up. You know, while at least, especially initially, before they have any loss of fluid. Um, but I'm I'm okay with that too. Um, 
so probably I'm thinking 20,000 front and 15,000 rear. And I'll see how that does over time. Yes, I have a lot of diff fluids. I buy these uh, boxes to keep various shock fluids and diff fluids. These are all diff fluids, as you can see. Uh, you know, 100,000. Um, you know, that's really thick stuff. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it. you can turn this upside down and it just takes forever for an air bubble to reach the top. But that's something for like center diffs. I've even got some 150,000 somewhere. So let's have a look at our, uh, our new aluminum diff cases. And these are really nice. I mean, they are virtually identical to the plastic. There's a little more, um, a little more rounding of the shapes just because it makes it easier than a, a molded plastic uh, because this is a machined piece of aluminum but it's really nice and uh, they give us an extra set of uh, these shafts which I'm not going to use at this time I'm going to just save them for future I've already got the gears on here the gears are all are as clean as whisker so um, there's no need to really change out anything they're already lubed with fluid um, all I need to do is drop everything in here and uh, put in fresh fluid and I'm off to the races so uh, that's what I'm gonna do we've got our shim okay we're seated and I just need this little screw. And of course, you can't use the black coarse threaded screws with the aluminum case. Those go to the plastic one, which is pretty much just trash at this point. But I'll probably save the screws. There's no need to save this. I'll never use that again. Um, but I will be using these fine threaded, uh, the proper screws for the aluminum case. And remember, don't tear up your fingers trying to hold this thing. Just take a thin Allen wrench and slide it into the drive like that. It makes it much easier to hold. So, yeah, see, there's a good... Ooh, I didn't put my bearing on. Mistake. I, was, I kept thinking, I'm, I'm forgetting something. I'm forgetting something. And I was forgetting something. You know, I'm thinking that I might be able to put a small O-ring on this side right here, just slide it over this, and that way it would uh, press up against this end here, and that might reduce or eliminate the leakage. Huh, let me see what I got in the parts bin. Okay, I've got, uh, I've got some of these little O-rings. Actually, I pulled out five instead of four. I need two for front and two for rear. These are basically uh, like a shock seal type of O-ring. Um, I've got them in one of my uh, many parts boxes. This is from my old uh, 22 short course truck. Um, this is like a decade old uh, bunch of parts here, uh, where the car is a decade old. Um, but in any event, uh, this car is now a uh, uh, 110 scale drag car. Um, some of you may have seen the uh, Corvette body with the, uh, the US flag paint job I did. Uh, particularly like that. Um, and uh, so what I'm doing here is uh, I'm going to put an O-ring on here. Now, when that gets screwed together, that's going to compress that a little bit. Okay, that is not going to work. That's just too tight. So, 
just going to have to live with a little bit of fluid loss. Unless I can find some, uh, some smaller O-rings somewhere. I may look, but uh, I'm not going to worry about it right this minute. I checked what I had, and I don't think I have anything else that would be... I know I've got some smaller o I mean, thinner O-rings, but not uh, the 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 rubber is thinner, but the diameters are incorrect for this application. So, uh, yeah. get that seated properly. So let me put these away. I'll take one more look. Maybe I got something. Okay, this is what I was referring to. These guys right here. If I had some that were of this size O-ring, the material, that were small enough, that would work. Um, I have these little... X-type uh, seals, but those, I think, are going to suffer the same fate as the others. I might try one just for kicks. I don't know. They're going to... They're not going to squeeze up enough. They're going to be tight. Um, it really needs to be the right size, and I just don't think I've got it. Okay, uh, remember I said I was just going to drop the gears in as they were? No can do. Um, the shafts that they provide are slightly shorter on the with the aluminum case. It's only a couple millimeters, but it's enough that the, the ones that come with the plastic will not fit. So make sure you use the ones that come with the aluminum case. Otherwise, everything is the same. They got the same notches. So it's easy enough. Just uh, swap the gears over. So then all you need to do is, I like using a needle nose for this part. Makes it easier to handle them. You just drop them down into the slot and you can kind of just tweak that bar around until it's uh, down in place and seated. And if you put one finger in from above, you can go ahead and rotate your gears, make sure that Everything's where it needs to be. So I'm going to call this one the rear. And I'm going to go ahead and fill this up with uh, 15,000. Now, especially as you go into the thicker fluids, make sure that you rotate them a little bit during the fill process to uh, make sure that fluid gets down into any gaps. Just get them and don't tighten anything straight away because you want to do that in a star pattern. We only have four bolts, so it's not exactly uh, true star patterning, but it still is worth doing that way. Oh, that's nice and smooth. 
yeah these cases are great you can tighten these things down as far as you can and uh, it, unlike the plastic one the aluminum can't collapse and uh, the shimming and everything seems to be just right there's no issues that I can tell and that diff turns really smooth I mean it's it's snug because of the thickness of the fluid but um, it's just like butter it's perfect I'm really glad I went with these and I really recommend them absolutely I mean any of these cars uh, they are going to perform better with a properly aligned arranged diff gears you're not going to have grinding or chewing and uh, you're going to have better power delivery consequently so um, do it it's worth it I mean you're talking what were they like eight dollars a piece um, you know and the shipping maybe twenty dollars added on to the car uh, plus a little bit of diff fluid and you're going to have just a much better result. I mean, that's the only thing different about this diff um, is, well, there's the gears too, but uh, still, um, even with the stock gears, you're probably so much better off with, uh, with the aluminum case. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the second one off camera. Um, you've seen the basic process. Uh, I didn't use any kind of seals or anything. It's just as is and um, so there we go. Um, you know, there's no way to 100% prevent um, some diff fluid getting out, uh, out here and out here. But, you know, such as it is, deal with it. Um, it's still a lot better than that waxy lube that was in these things. Um, you know, you could always go up in fluid uh, thickness trying to get it to stay. Maybe you can find some... Uh, o-ring somewhere uh, a lot of you guys like to experiment with these cars um, so if you uh, if you decide to go in this direction and you find you're losing fluid too rapidly um, and you come across a solution for that please let me know I'll happily post it for everybody and credit you uh, speaking of crediting people um, well one of the commenters uh, has an interesting project going he um, uh, and this is actually is a great idea because these cars at the price they are make a really nice um, baseline for some larger project. Uh, he wants to make a, um, a RC version of the Toy Story car. And uh, I think he's got one of the original plastic cars that, you know, isn't powered or anything. It's just like a... Uh, you know, like a, a replica, and uh, but it has the same wheelbase as this chassis. So he's going to use this chassis and uh, and build that up. And that sounds like a really neat idea. You could do a lot of stuff like that. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of custom projects. Aside from uh, you know doing racing, I like doing you know totally off the wall stuff. And uh, um, you know that's a that's a cool thing to do with one of these uh one of these chassis and at the price point these come in at you know go ahead and fiddle around come up with something different okay i wanted to show you a few things um this is the new drive shaft this is the one that comes with the car as you can see it's got a plastic gear instead of the metal gear that comes on this one but that's not the whole story if you recall i bought a set of gears when I got the car to upgrade them and this is the gear the pinion gear that comes with the new axle um, now I don't have any complaints about them they seem to be a good high quality gear they're definitely better than the stock ones and as you can see uh, these gears here are a higher quality than the ones that come on the stock drive shaft you can just look at the you can just see the quality of the machining or the uh the pouring is better this is a cheaper metal also it seems like some kind of pot metal uh versus this looks like a hardened steel um so i would definitely you know when you buy the if you buy a new drive shaft you're going to get a higher quality gear but and here's the but the gear set that i got uh 
aside from the higher quality uh, ring gears, the pinion gears are also high quality like the ones that come on the new drive shaft. In fact, they appear to be identical. Um, but it's, it's this gear and the pinion gear for the motor that I'm going to change because that kit that I bought, the set of gears, has a metal uh, main drive gear for the drive shaft and it also comes with a metal pinion gear and they appear to be of the same you know quality the the teeth are you know are you know mesh well and such but the ones that come with the drive shaft are heavier because the ones that came in the kit that I got have been machined to remove some excess metal and as you can see we're dealing with probably several grams because we're working with steel, not aluminum or plastic. So I am going to be switching these two gears and using the ones that came in that gear kit that I purchased because of the weight difference. Now, you may not think that that weight is a big deal, but rotating mass is one of the more critical things that you want to reduce in a car. Reducing the overall weight of a vehicle obviously is a performance boost, but unsprung weight, which is weight that is outside of the chassis that is hung on the springs and suspension points, like your wheels, your brakes, your bearings, that's all unsprung weight. Anything you can do to reduce unsprung weight makes the suspension react more quickly. The less weight, the faster that this, the wheel and tire can move out of the way of a bump and back into, into place again. Um, likewise, rotating mass, the less rotating mass, the faster the motor can spin it up and slow it back down again. Now you might think, well, you know, having some weight, you get a little momentum. Well, we're not building a flywheel here. We're not storing energy. Um, so lightening up, this gear by several grams is definitely going to make the car accelerate a little bit faster. Um, it may not be something we could easily measure, but it's going to be there. Um, so, you know, if, if you took this gear and this gear and you put them on some kind of a machine with a motor where you could, uh, you know, measure the, the weight of the amount of energy it takes to spin them up to a given RPM and then slow them back down again, this is going to go up and down faster. The plastic gear will go even faster, but you know, you've got the, you know, is this reliable? Now, I, I might even keep the plastic gear because this thing is a feather compared to, to these, uh, these two gears here. And I haven't heard anything about people having problems with these. Um, most of the cars I race have uh, plastic gears at one point or other. You just don't want them like inside your diff or something like that. And if the uh, if they're cut properly and the gears mesh well, you know, there's no problem there. So um, the reason I'm switching the dry shaft is because of that broken bolt and because I want to have the better gears here. So I may just, uh, you know, pull use this drive shaft because this drive shaft is trash because it's got a bolt broken off inside it um, use these outer gears and use this plastic gear so that's probably what I'll start with and if this plastic gear ever breaks I've got the metal gears to fall back on um, now this drive gear here is also a lightened gear but I need to look at the quality of the metal on that. If it's the same quality as these guys here, I'm gonna swap it for this one. Otherwise, I'm okay. So we'll find out about that once we get a look inside here. And to do that, I need to flip the car upside down and get that bolt. Now I put my diffs in here with some uh, fresh grease, but I don't, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna really need to get in there right now because I need to put the drive shaft back in so I can't bolt these down completely but I'm going to put two bolts one on either side just to hold these diff cases these covers down while I'm working on on that and that will just uh, keep the diffs from opening I mean keep the uh, diff cases from opening up on me and having my diffs flop out and my dog bones flopping around and 
Uh, that sounds kind of rude. <laughs> Um, but anyway, that will, uh, that'll make it easier to work on the car at this point. So. And remember I talked about, uh, swapping out these cases at some point and putting on, uh, better hardware, um, getting rid of these coarse thread screws and uh, Allen heads. Well, I got the pair of diff cases in finally. Um, they arrived, but I haven't gotten replacement hardware and I need to spec out what I'm gonna use and make final decisions on that before I go into that whole assembly process. Another thing I recommend um, is getting more than two of the aluminum diff cases because the screws that hold them on, they're steel, but they're very thin and you can shear the heads off of them. I hate to admit it, but I over tightened one of them. Uh, I was doing my star pattern and one of them, I turned it and all of a sudden it was turning too easy and I realized I'd gone a little too far and snapped one off and I couldn't retrieve the bolt um, it had broken off flush with the case. Uh, fortunately, I had bought an extra diff case, and so I would buy at least three diff cases in case you damage one of them at some point the way I did. Um, they're so inexpensive that it, it seems worth having them around. So um, if you'd only get the two, be very careful. You can tighten them down pretty tight, but you can also go too far. I was trying to be reasonably gentle, but I was trying to get as much of a seal as possible. And, you know, I got a little overzealous with the screwdriver. So, you know, bear that in mind, learn from my experience. So now it's time to deal with this broken screw here, or stripped screw right there. And Let's see how these guys work here. So that's a pretty, you know, it's a small screw. I'm guessing the smallest one of these is the one I'm going to want. And I may need to drill that out a bit. I may just be able to use it as is. I'm going to try it without doing any drilling first. And we'll see how that works. I think I'll try this bit first and this bit second. So I'm going to power up my uh, soldering station over here and get that heated up. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video for a moment while that warms up. Okay, so we want to try to get the... Um, get the Loctite loosened up, the thread locker. Okay, I'm just gonna drill out that screw all together. Let's go with four millimeter. Can turn off the soldering iron. There go. Get my little vac in here and clean this up. So that's toast, the motor mount at least there's no way I'm getting that screw out now. Don't take anything for granted with these kits. I'm serious. Um, this is a brand new drive shaft and I thought, okay, I'm going to switch the gear. If I hadn't, I wouldn't have noticed that this screw wasn't just loose. It was probably two millimeters from being screwed down to base. Um, the other end here also was very, very loose, like about a millimeter loose. If, if you pulled on the gear, you would have had the gear jiggling 
forward and backward. Um, these little screws are terrible. I don't know what kind of steel they're made out of. I've never seen steel so soft. I popped the head on one of them. Fortunately, there was enough sticking out for me to be able to grab it with a pair of needle nose pliers and untwist it. Um, put on a fresh one. Use some Loctite to make sure they stay in place. Don't use too much. You'll never get them out without breaking them. Um, I don't know what it is with this hardware, but it's just garbage. Um, the screws just break and break and break. Uh, I put on the new motor mount, as you can see. Um, no issues with that, at least none right off the bat. But it seems, I don't know. Um, it's different than the motor mount that came stock with that. Let me, okay. Uh, The screws are different, okay, and the the threading size is different. The this motor mount has um, screws that are like M2s instead of M3s. Uh, not happy about that. The heads on them are about that big. Um, they almost disappear into the uh, countersinking. <sighs> I don't know. If you don't have to do a motor swap, stick with your stock motor. Um, first off, you can't get any of this stuff off. You're never going to get this gear off of here. They they have so much um, thread locker on that grub screw in there. I, I'm using good quality tools and the, the grub screw is so soft and there's so much Loctite that before I could even start to loosen it, it just spun. And it's, it's you know, there's no way I'm getting that off of there. Um, you know, there's no way I can get in there with any kind of tool because there's no space. Um, yeah, not, uh, not real impressed. And this, you know, what do you want for a hundred dollars? You know, this is the difference between a good quality race kit and some cheap little Chinese thing that's basically a toy. Um, you know, it's it's too bad because it, it reeks of potential. If, if the hardware was really hardened steel and it didn't break at the, you know, the softest twist of a wrench, um, you know, I don't know what to say. It is what it is. So, uh... You know, use your best judgment when you, you know, when you're planning to make mods to this. Um, if you've got several hundred dollars to spend on top of this kit, get all your money together in one pile and buy a decent kit. Buy a TLR, buy a Kyosho, you know, buy a Schumacher, get an X-Ray, get any of the name brand, get an Associated but get yourself a real car. But I mean, when you consider that for a hundred dollars, you're getting a radio, a speed controller, a servo, a motor, you know, the whole schmack. Um, they just can't give you quality. So don't expect it to be. And don't get surprised when things break or, you know, don't work as well as you'd otherwise like. Just, just saying, you know, um, it's not their fault. They, you just can't produce quality at that price point. It's, you get one or the other. So it's back together. I've uh, got the new motor in, um, receiver, ESC, everything soldered up. I uh, just got the two battery connections uh, uh, just anchored under here right now with the Velcro just to keep them out of the way. Um, uh, not gonna have to use the body pins anymore because I put some Velcro tabs at uh, four corners here, got them on the body. And uh, I left the posts on anyway because that just helps center the body. So it's easy enough to just uh, put the body on like that. Boom, it's in place. Um, I don't usually run a switch, but the ESC had one and it's a, a fixture. It's 
attached to this ESC, you can't uh, remove it uh, without having to like jump it and solder the wires. So I figured I would just go ahead and leave it and uh, went ahead and attached it to the body up here. So it's easy to get to. Um, uh, on is rearward, uh, which is always a good way to do things so that um, if something bumps it, it's not turning the car off. So other than that, uh, everything's together. I'll do a speed test on it in the morning. It's fine as it is. It's a nice little buggy to drive around. Um, it's nothing that I can race because it's not of a scale that they would race these and, um, you know, for what it is, it's pretty heavy. Uh, so, you know, I, I think for the, the new person to the hobby, it's an excellent kit. Um, you get a, an awful lot for the money. I would, I would do the diffs with the aluminum cases. I would probably just leave the stock motor. Um, and if you don't already own another radio, I wouldn't bother swapping out the ESC because you've got to buy a receiver, an ESC, and a speed and a servo. Um, because the, again, that servo doesn't work with standard receivers. So um, that's a lot of stuff to buy for a hundred dollar car. So I would just leave it as it is, learn to drive it well, uh, make the most of it, have fun, don't waste a ton of money on upgrades, save money for your next kit and buy something, you know, professional grade or, you know, professional grade is a relative term because um, buy something from a, a real name brand like, you know, Associated, Low C, Schumacher, X-Ray, Geosho, Tamiya even. Tamiya makes, Tamiya's cars are more toys than race vehicles. Um, unless you're doing something like one of the classes that is specifically made for only Tamiya cars. But let's say you like uh, the 10 scale all wheel drive buggies. You pretty much want to go with an X-Ray, uh, a low C or an Associated. Those are the three big brands is, and really low scene associated to the big brands in the US. Um, X-Ray is more of a, a European uh, manufacturer. I don't know why more people here don't uh, race them because they make excellent, uh, excellent equipment, but they are the high end price of all the cars. Um, so anyway, that those are my recommendations. If you just want something to tinker with and have fun, for hundred dollars, you know, hundred and fifteen dollars, you can't beat it. It's it's a nice little car, but trying to make it into more than it is, you're going to run up against problems. And the real problem I see, like one of the things I was thinking about doing with this, was, you know, lowering it down, putting on road tires, putting on a slick body, and seeing how fast I could make this go. Well, the biggest restriction there is the fact that you cannot change this gear or the gear on the motor. The motor mount does not have slots in it that allow you to adjust the distance of the motor from the axle. So you can't change pinion gears. If you can't change the gearing, you can't adjust speed. Um, you pretty much are stuck with all of their gear ratios throughout and that's it. So the only way you could make this thing go faster would be to get an electric motor that can go to higher RPMs, uh, put in a bigger battery pack. And at that point, you know, you're at some point you're going to run up against the theoretical limit of what the motor can do. So you're not going to go faster anyway. You're never going to turn this into a hundred mile an hour buggy, not without a massive amount of effort. You'd have to custom make motor mounts, uh, all kinds of things. And at, at some point you're running up against what the drivetrain can realistically handle without braking anyway. So why bother? It's a nice little buggy as it sits have fun with it, enjoy yourselves, you know, get the one, instead of spending money on extra junk for it, like aluminum arms and stuff like that, which just weigh it down and make it not handle as well because they don't fit as good. Um, get yourself the one with the three batteries. So you've got lots of runtime and get yourself the, the two aluminum diff cases. And, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you can get that upgraded uh, set of gears that I got to have nicer uh, pinion ring gears and internal gears for the diffs. 
Um, but other than that, that, that's all I would do to this car uh, and just have fun with it. So, and of course, you know, putting in the, uh, the droop screws and, you know, tune the suspension well, you know, adjust, make sure your camber and your toe are adjusted properly. Um, that's about it. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this series of videos, uh, other than maybe, uh, showing you how this does off road. I'm going to try and get to an outdoor off-road track soon and uh, put this through its paces. But other than that, I'm probably not going to take this any further as far as modifications. I just don't see the, uh, I don't see an upside. Um, I'm just going to have fun with it, just like I hope you guys do. Well, it's only slightly faster than it was with the stock motor uh, as far as top speed goes, but the driving dynamic is completely different. It has so much torque, it's almost hard to control. It just wants to rip the tires loose from the asphalt and uh, spin. And I mean all four tires at the same time. It's quite impressive. But this is a level of power that's just not very usable. Five miles an hour but a whole lot more torque as in like hard to control torque so these tires aren't measuring up right now the first time I just yanked the throttle on it it just was all over the place and even when I was applying throttle judiciously it still wanted to get away I think the stock motor is about where this car should be and much more power than that and you just end up with something that uh, that isn't very drivable and I think in an off-road situation this would be much worse so to all those of you who are buying one of these and want to do crazy mods to it I wouldn't do it keep the stock motor 34 miles an hour or so is plenty fast. It's almost more speed than you need for something of this scale. If you're driving off-road, you're certainly not going to be hitting 34 miles an hour on dirt, uh, especially on any type of track where your straightaways aren't very long. And you're better off dialing down the speed a little bit. If you have a better radio already, or you're gonna buy yourself a nice surface radio, for example, the, uh, the Fly Sky 6 channel, uh, you're gonna be able to take advantage of Exponential and things like that. Exponential will ramp up the throttle input on a curve as opposed to a straight line. So it can make the car a little easier to drive. And uh, having a better ESC, Things like that, if you did want to go in that direction and then go with a slightly hotter motor, I wouldn't go uh, as far as I went with the 12-turn motor. I would go with something like a 21-turn motor. You could even leave the stock motor, just, you know, 
swap out the uh, receiver for uh, uh, the receiver in ESC for standalone items and using a better transmitter. And then, of course, you've got to swap the servo as well. So that would be worthwhile because that would make the car more drivable. Uh, even with the stock motor, you would still have the benefit of exponential. You would also be able to use exponential on steering. And that can be really nice also um, because it takes the twitchiness out of trying to keep a straight line. So the first, you know, 10 or 15% of the steering either left or right has less input change than the top 10 or 15% that has a lot more. Uh, so again, it's your, instead of a straight line, you've got a curve. So um, it makes the steering less sensitive uh, near its center point, thus making it easier to keep the car straight. You're not weaving left and right mm -hmm. so there's a lot of benefits to going with a better radio than what comes with it at the same time i would stay with the two cell batteries and i would stay with the uh, uh the stock motor or in that range of motor if you put in a 12.5 like i've done or something even hotter or you go brushless um, first, if you go brushless, you're spending a lot more money. The speed control is more expensive. The motor's more expensive. I don't see that there's a big benefit there. The, um, the brush motors run just fine uh, for this type of vehicle. It is only a $100 buggy. It's not, you know, a $400 name brand uh, RC car. So putting super high-end stuff into it just it doesn't merit it i am going to do some more videos on this i'm going to get this out in the dirt um i'm going to tune the radio um you know put in some exponential set set things up a little uh better uh, i just wanted to get a speed run in today um uh, my wife brought a cold home and we were both kind of sick over the last couple of days so I wanted to get this video out to you guys as soon as possible and uh, so I just took the radio set up as is and I didn't you know tinker with uh, any of the advanced settings so that's something I'll do in another video and like I said I'm probably gonna swap out the wheels and tires for something of a larger diameter something that's a little better for dirt and I'm gonna see about getting off somewhere uh, where I can, you know, you know uh, find a local BMX track or something that I can go and bounce this thing around and uh, kind of show you what it's capable of off-road. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please click like and please subscribe to my channel. 